Well, welcome, gentlemen. We've had two days of tremendous preaching, tremendous singing. It is a joy to hear men sing who love Christ and to be able to be with them. Now, we've heard some great preaching on the topic of truth triumphs. Now we're going to come down to implementing it. Truth triumphs. How do we live it out? Come on up, Bill. How do we live it out down in the trenches when you're hand-to-hand combat, when you're fighting spiritual forces of darkness? How are we going to work through that? So we're going to have a discussion. Uh, My name is George Crawford. I've had the privilege of serving as an elder here since 1996. We uh, have a saying here that some of our elders are good for something and some of them are good for nothing. (laughs) The former being guys who are on staff, the latter being guys who, uh, using a very non-biblical term, are lay elders. I am one of the latter. Uh, With me, and I'm going to ask the gentleman to give, in the interest of brevity, in the interest of a military carryover, name, rank, and serial number, starting with Mr. Hargrove. And what uh, areas of ministry do you do here at Grace? Grace Advance is uh, a ministry where we help uh, churches in North America plant churches and revitalize. And also with Bill Shannon, um, pastor fellowship group here called Anchor. Um, of some history with Grace Church, just briefly, I was sent out um, by Grace Church in 1993 to plant the church. And did that for 20 years. And 10 years ago, asked to come back. So I've um, been back here for 10 years now, okay. after 20 years of ministry. Tom? Tom Patton. I'm a pastor here at Grace Church. I'm an elder as well. I also have a fellowship group that I pastor along with John Street, who's right over there talking as I'm talking, which is interesting. Uh, <laughs> he knows me, so he doesn't care. Uh, and... Um, been here for about 30 years. Since 1991 is when I came here. Been on staff since 2001. And uh, also teach at the seminary. I teach preaching there. And um, I'm a part of Grace Advance of Carl's yeah. ministry as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, we all kind of do a lot of things around here. We all yeah. wear a lot of different hats. But that's what we I We wear do. a multiplicity of hats. We do. <laughs> one of hats, one of the hats that uh, Tom wears uh, oh, is yeah. that of... Ranger Joe. Yes, I should have brought my hat. Sorry, yeah. uh, but yeah. so if you want to catch truly, uh, another, hat. A truly another hat, truly another yeah, hat. Ranger Joe episodes, you can find them on Grace Media. And, yes, Grace uh, Media. App. I've been telling him, Mr. Rogers, move over. <laughs> so Tom is also the voice of Grace Church. Uh, most of the time, uh, he is the MC, if you would want to call it as such for our morning worship service and even the evening worship service, and we're grateful for it. It's a privilege. Him. Bill, have a seat. First of all, I need to seek forgiveness. <laughs> I got up here late, but I can't get through that uh, courtyard without seeing an old friend. Um, uh, and they're all old. I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> I've been here uh, for 42 years at Grace Community Church. I've been on staff for 34 years now, and uh, I oversee the counseling department here at Grace Church. Uh, We teach counseling. We uh, try to train folks that can help with counseling, uh, whether it be prayer room counseling or it be uh, individuals in Bible study, whatever it is. Uh, That's what we do. As Carl has already told you, uh, we co-pastor Anchored Fellowship Group. We um, take our own. Somebody always asks me, so do you follow each other in the Bible? No, we do our own thing. Uh, because uh, Carl doesn't let me tell him what to do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's tried. <laughs> <laughs> so All right. That's, uh, that's my history. I have two girls. Uh, both of those girls are married to fine men. One of them, my son-in-law is down in the main sanctuary, my competition right now, uh, speaking <laughs> there. And the other one is in Arizona, and he's the elder at uh, his church that he goes to. Yes. So. You can always tell a lot about a man by looking at what his adult children are doing. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's been a history of faithfulness here. 
I work in the area. I, my secular world uh, employment was as a prosecuting attorney uh, and as an administrative law judge. I taught part-time at Masters University uh, for something like 30 years. Since uh, I was able to walk away, I have been redeployed into ministry here. Uh, I serve on our Grace Advance team. That is one of the most important ministries we have here and probably one of the most un least known ministries internally uh, and outside most appreciated. I also serve on our missions board, uh, Grace Missions International. We do everything we can to try to proclaim the word of God throughout the nations uh, book of Malachi, my name will be great among the nations. So we passionately committed to that. Now, what are we wanting to accomplish today? Again, as I indicated earlier, we've heard some great preaching. Now we need to think through how it is that we can encourage ourselves in the process uh, by wrestling with some challenging questions. In uh, 1 Timothy 3.15, Paul he writes, he says, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support, the buttress, the bulwark of the truth. We are going to try to start off with some questions that we'll ask internally. I uh, want to get you to start thinking. Uh, I'm going to have three somewhat abstract questions, and I'll move to three very practical questions mm -hmm. that if you've been in ministry for any length of time, you've probably to one extent or another uh, addressed these uh, or thought about them. My son, Steve, who's in uh, pastoral ministry in Kansas, was cautioning me that we need to include something, something like this. Then we're going to turn the mic over to questions from the floor. Make sure uh, and I've already, already asked the guys to screen them, make sure that if I ask you, is there really a question here, you can answer yes. Mm. We all know of guys that come to the mic under Q&A and they want to pose a statement. So make sure it's really a question. Uh, and we'll try to ask them, we'll try to get them. We want you to feel the freedom to the extent uh, you can, the freedom to be able to speak questions that are from the heart, that are really on your mind. We have an hour. Uh, we are more than willing to talk after the expiration of that hour, fully expecting, fully realizing that that may need to be done. So let's start with a word of prayer and then we'll get going. Father in heaven, I want to thank you for each of these men, many of them I've not seen in years. Thank you for their commitment to Christ. Thank you for the love for your church that has brought them to this particular point. Father, we pray that men will be encouraged, they will be strengthened, they will be injected with iron and a determination to continue serving as the foundation and bulwark of your truth. Guide us, Lord, in all we do today. We trust you. Amen. Now, in keeping with the theme of the conference, as you think through the question, frame it. Keep in mind that it needs to be approaching the idea centered around the truth. So I'm going to start this off with number one. Technology. Over the last five to ten years, in our culture, in the church at large, or, and at Grace Community Church, where and how have you seen departures from or disobedience to the truth? Oh my, five to ten years? Five to ten of years. disobedience to the truth, <laughs> and we have an hour. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, I think you go back to just that, the truth. So all of the departures um, are going to find their origin in a denial that there is an absolute truth. So I just think it's been manifest in different ways, whether it be manifest in how we understand gender, whether it's been manifest in how we understand a woman's role, uh, a man's role, 
whether it's manifest in, in how we preach, uh, whether it's manifest in what we believe about Christ, um, all of those things have an origin, and the origin is based in a denial of an absolute truth. Okay. Uh, you know, it's the question that, that Pilate asked, what is truth? Well, we have the definition for that um, because the church, according to uh, Paul's words to Timothy, uh, the church is the pillar and supporter of a truth. Did it say that? No, the truth uh, that we proclaim uh, the gospel and all of its implications uh, that come with it. So it's just the, the manifestations of disobedience are varying. Okay. Yeah. Um, everything, like I said, from how do we understand a man to same-sex attraction to uh, the list goes on and on and on. But the basis of it is a denial of truth. Yeah, and I mean, if you're not sure what truth is, Mark Zakevich is doing a seminar right now on the topic if you want yeah. to transfer. You can leave now. That's fine. <laughs> Tom, you were going to say something. No, I was just going to piggyback off of what Carl said. I think, you know, when you think of the culture, um, the departure from the truth is probably most manifested in the fact that um, they no longer really hold to a truth. They never, no longer really hold to some of the things that we're used to. Um, I'd say, generally speaking, it's more permissiveness in sin. That would be the general topic, uh, being more permissive, more uh, less guilt even on a very superficial level huh. to feel uh, any kind of restraint upon them. It says in the scripture that the Holy Spirit in the uh, days of the ban of lawlessness will uh, release his, his uh, restraint. And so it seems as if that restraint is becoming less and less as time goes on. So without the particulars of how that looks in the world, I think um, my mind goes to how it looks like in the church, what it's been the big effect over the last 10 years. Sure. I remember when my dad was in the church uh, as a young man, uh, there was always a sense that maybe the church was more biblical back in the day. We're talking about in the 50s and 60s. Um, but I've learned as time goes on, that's not necessarily the case. It was more masked. Uh, more and more, the church was kind of just being moral and trying to uh, not really speak about things that were urgent. For instance, uh, church discipline, we think, or I used to think, was something that was a part of church history when my dad was growing up. I asked John MacArthur one time about that. He said, you know what? I don't remember church discipline even being in my father's church or the churches at his time. So this is something that, in some ways, we've come more advanced in some of our reform circles to be uh, taking the Bible more seriously. But you see more permissiveness in the culture, and I think you see... Um, a, at least in our circles, more seriousness about uh, the doctrines of grace and, and the truth of the scripture. So that's happening. But I know it seems to some people who are looking at it maybe a little superficially, like this is an avalanche and where is this all coming from? But it seems like the storm has been building for a very long time. So I'm, um, I think Martin Lloyd-Jones is the one that said, you know, I'm I'm really never surprised because the Bible tells us that these things will happen. I'm not sitting in shock thinking, how can this be? But I think our people are in shock, and our people have to be fortified. And so one of the greatest things I think we can teach our people is uh, this is not a surprise to God, and we can prove that by going to the Scripture and showing that these things have been predicted from Jesus' day and before, and I think that's a helpful way to look at it. So we, to some degree... Uh, react to that by helping our people get past yeah. the shock, by helping them to realize that this is nothing that has taken God by a surprise. Right, and I think they find comfort in their pastor having that kind of um, poise about the truth so that they're not seeing you shaken by the things in the world because you're rooted in the Scripture and you know what our Lord has said and what the uh, book of Revelation has said and the book of Daniel that we found out from Abner. These things are to make us shockproof, if you will. We might be surprised, but we're not shocked. And to some degree, we help people by uh, helping the weak, strengthening the weak, dealing with situations where people have been scarred. Bill, you want to talk to that? Um, by the <clears throat> loss I of... The idea of what's coming into the church, I think is what's been in the culture for a while, is the cancel culture is starting to come into the church. And some of you men start to feel that pressure from people um, that are not liking what you're doing or how the church is doing it and those kinds of things. And they bring those questions in all the time, and, uh, it, which has absolutely nothing to do with the truth, but they're, they're hammering away at you. 
um, uh, ever so slowly, and I think that's part of what Satan's plan is, and, and uh, he's using the people of God even to do those kinds of things. How do we help them, though? How do we help our brothers and sisters? And the only way to do that is through the truth. I think of uh, 1 Timothy 1.5, the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart, a sincere faith. That's, what we're, that's the goal of our instruction. We need to keep teaching them and teaching them and teaching them even when they don't listen. I can remember not too long ago receiving an email from a husband and wife, and the husband and wife wrote, we are not listening to you in the counseling room. You're not the only one is what I answered. <laughs> <laughs> but that's if what If Bill happens. wanted to hear that, he could talk to his wife, Donna. Yeah, well... <laughs> I do listen to her. <laughs> but, I mean, that's part of what the, the people want to do. They, they want to throw back at you that you're not what you are saying you are. So. Okay, great. Now, it's interesting that you mentioned Satan. In my own uh, personal study, I've been reading Luther's commentary on the book of Galatians. Galatians 3.1, and this is from the NKJV. O foolish Galatians... Who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? And that's added in the uh, King James and the New King James. You won't find it in the NASB or the ESV. Who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? Any thoughts as to the extent to which this departure, this rejection of the truth, is due to the evil one, and how do we react to that? Thoughts on that? Um, well, we know that um, society is under the God of this world. That's clear. Um, uh, that's why when a person comes to face 2 Corinthians 4, this veil is removed, but prior to it, they were blinded, their minds were blinded. So you say, well, their mind was blinded because that's Ephesians chapter 4, because they walked in the futility of their mind. They were darkened in their understanding. So we can see that there is an influence uh, that is there. It's a spiritual influence. So if he's the God of this world, you're going to orchestrate the world in accord to your ultimate goal. Uh, the ultimate goal would be to thwart the plans of God, but we all know, praise God, that that cannot happen, right, brothers? Mm -hmm. That can't happen. We know how it ends. Our God is victorious. But he is doing everything he can to disrupt um, God glorifying himself, which means operating through principalities and power, powers and higher uh, entities in, these, uh, in society, uh, in politics, in culture, um, in religion itself. Because every other religion, uh, its backdrop is going to be the enemy uh, because he is the enemy of the souls of men. So uh, that's where we come back to. Um, ultimately, the devil is, the scripture is clear, he is a liar. Yes. And he has been a liar from the beginning. What passage is that so, from, Carl? So John. 844. Yeah, eight, yeah. Make sure. Two things. He okay. is a murderer and he is a liar. <laughs> yeah. And when he speaks, he speaks lies. It is his yeah. native language. Go ahead. Which is the opposite of what we're talking about. Lies don't triumph. Truth triumphs. So he will not triumph. Um, the truth will be triumphant. So Christ told us that's his very nature to do that. So in society, we can say that uh, the lies are um, propagated by the hand of the enemy. So we do battle. This is why Ephesians chapter 6 Six tells us what? That we, we're not fighting against flesh and blood. Uh, this is why Paul said, even what we heard in the first message um, from 2 Corinthians, that um, these spiritual fortresses we bring down. Uh, we bring them down with different weapons. Um, and that weapon is the truth of God's word and its preaching. So ultimately, the key approach is bringing truth to bear. Tom, yep. you had something in mind. You're looking for a passage. I can read that. No, I just noticed face. you were quizzing us, so I thought I might be prepared. <laughs> <laughs> Good man. <laughs> I'm, read, yeah, we, I'm reading we kinda, ahead. We, I didn't kinda know. Kind of already went to ordination, George. So. <laughs> so, Always be ready to speak and give a defense of the hope that is in you, Joe. Especially with George. Uh, <laughs> Go ahead, Tom. No, I was just going to say... Um, 
in our particular context because of the fact we are just down the street from one of the largest charismatic churches in California, um, we have dealt over the years with the fact that people have come and done a lot of um, confessing blame on Satan for their sin. And sure. so instead mm-hmm. of going to yeah. the book of James and speaking about, well, isn't that from uh, the temptations which wage war in you, and, and isn't that also your own sin giving birth to that? And, and uh, so we've had to kind of walk people back from emphasis on, you know, as uh, Sanford and Sons used to say, the devil made me do it. If you remember that, some of you are not old enough that to know that. Flip Wilson, Flip Wilson, <laughs> uh, yeah, that was Flip Wilson, Flip Wilson, excuse me. I defer. Uh, so uh, I can't get the scripture right or the television program right. But, uh, but do you know, the idea there is uh, that's a real thing that sometimes our church, I believe, can almost discount because we're trying to overcorrect from people sure. who think that there's so much influence by Satan that... Um, the devil made me do it. So sure. it's a balance that we walk. Uh, years ago, people would come here and um, have just been so uh, obsessed with the idea that Satan is uh, guiding their every thought, mm. even though they're believers. And we're saying that can't be true. Yeah. Uh, you can be influenced. You can be harassed. Sure. Um, Satan is powerful. Uh, you go to the book of Job chapter 1 and you see uh, with God's permission, he can do whatever God allows him to do. As Luther said, uh, the devil is God's devil. Correct. And so that is something that we have to keep in balance here. So instead of overcompensating and trying to say, no, it's all just your sin, we have to have an appreciation for the fact, no, Satan is real, is the tempter, even in the uh, in the uh, Lord's Prayer, uh, many translations will say, you know, keep us from temptation and deliver us from evil or from the evil one. The evil one. Right. So you have sure. to be mindful that there is a balance in that, and you're always kind of never wanting to discount the power of that creature, uh, as was described earlier today, but also on the other side, not to de-emphasize someone's own sin for leading them into temptation. Mm. Excellent. Excellent. Bill, you want to add anything? Yes, I do. Um, I'm thinking, I'm looking out here, and I see uh, either men that are elders, men that are about to be elders, maybe men that are thinking they'd like to be elders. Uh, How do we protect the church? We have to know the truth ourselves in order to protect the church. Because you have people that come, that want to become members even. And and I've seen that at Grace Church, who want to become members, and they they can't give a testimony, or, or they don't know the answer to some simple questions. That's how we protect the church. When we just give them a rubber stamp and let them in, all you're doing is letting in trouble. So you have to protect that church as much as possible, and that is not only just the preaching, but then when you're visiting with them, even one-on-one, wait a minute, that's not true. Uh, I had somebody give me a testimony once. He says, yes, when I was three or four, I I went to sleep, and I believed I was in heaven, I saw Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, and I became a Christian. I knew right away he didn't become a Christian because he did not know what it meant to be a a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. So make sure we're protecting the church first, right up front. Acts 20, Paul writes to the Ephesian elders, keep watch over yourself, keep watch over the church. One of the most thought-provoking passages in all of the New Testament, he says, from among yourselves, there will arise men. And these were men who he had discipled. These were men whom he had uh, served with, prayed with, cried with. He says, from among yourselves, there will be men who arise to pervert the truth, to draw people away after themselves. And we have to be vigilant against even that. Fantastic to point that out, Bill. Uh, If you want any more thought on this information, I would recommend... Uh, First of all, John's sermon, November of 2017, on this particular text, Galatians 3.1. Also, Luther on Galatians 3.1. We don't want to make too much of it, but we do not want to ignore the reality of it. Now, we're living in a world, as a culture, we've talked about this already, uh, Romans 1.25. We're looking at a world that uh, has perverted good and evil. Isaiah 5.20, Malachi 2.17, people are saying, where is the God of justice? Why isn't he doing anything about this? They're calling that which the scripture says evil, they're calling it good, and they're doing the converse. 
How do we cope and respond to that within the church? I'll start with Bill, and then we'll work our way back to Carl. Okay. Uh, again, you still have to come back to teaching the truth. If, if you're just having uh, coffee uh, and, and just having those kinds of times, I think you need to be up front with your people and teaching them all the time. Uh, that is what's, I think, most vital is um, uh, somebody came here and visited Grace Church. They took a, 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 a walk around. They spent uh, two weeks here. The guy came to me afterwards, and he says, all you guys do here is teach God's word. <laughs> and and I, we I, say, I, you I, have I, a problem I, with that? And I, I, I looked at him, and I said, is there something else to teach? Because, I mean, what do we have? This is the only thing that makes it valid. Right here is God's truth, and he's given it to us, and we need to continue to teach that. And that, by the way, is the basis of all of our counsel. There is, at times, very subtle ways of trying to inject something else mm -hmm. into being the basis of our counsel. No, we are from the scripture. We will not speak beyond what God has called us to say. Tom. Well, just listening to what you were saying, um, you know, the world does say what is evil is good, and, and we say uh, that no, that's defined by Scripture. So it does go back even to what Bill's talking about, <clears throat> which is to be known by being a man of the Word. And what I've noticed is that it's very, very easy just to get into kind of practical one-on-one -on -one discussion with your flock, um, social things, issues in life, and to try to kind of relate to them and to stray away from just going to the Bible because people might think, well, they know this, they've heard this, this is not something that I just don't want to be a person that's like a Bible thumper, if you will. But in my experience, when you don't do that, at least at our church, and again, I haven't been anywhere in years and years, uh, <laughs> he's thumping the Bible, uh, is that uh, when we don't do that, people will literally criticize and will sit there and say, you know what? So-and-so, uh, I went to see him, and uh, he didn't open up in prayer. He didn't direct me to passages with addresses assigned to them. Uh, all we did was talk about my issues. And I'm thinking, that happened here? That happened at Grace Church? So don't be afraid uh, to just open the Bible. In fact, in my office, if you come in, I just have a Bible that's already open on the other side of the table. And it's there so people don't even have an excuse because if they don't bring their Bible, there's one right there. It's open. And then I have them read out the passage that I'm directing them to because sometimes it's even more effective for me to have them hear their own voice speak God's word than even me to speak it to them. So they have to actually take mm -hmm. the time to do it. It's, it's a simple little technique someone told me years ago. But again, it goes back to the question, how do you discern between what is good and what is evil? Well, there's only one way to discern it, and that is through God's word. And we believe that, but sometimes through time urgency or just, I don't know, the, the desire to be, um, maybe if you have a small church, the desire to be uh, more kind of a friendly, um, user-friendly kind of church where you're not trying to, quote-unquote, judge them, uh, that you might talk uh, politics, you might talk philosophy or whatever you might do, and you know it's not what they need, but you're trying to be relatable, I would just really say that the most relatable thing in the world is just cutting it straight. Mm -hmm. And cutting it straight with the Bible is the only option that we have. Great. Mm -hmm. Tom? Uh, Carl? Carl, yeah. Um, let's just kind of be direct here. Um, it's the Word of God. We all agree with that. Um, that's why you came here with 5,000 other men. Um, to this conference because you knew you would hear the word of God. So look at 1 Timothy with me. You would notice if you were to go through Timothy, I think it was like 13 places where you're going to see doctrine either said specifically or by clear inference. Um, verse 3, not to teach strange doctrines. So you're instructing, which means you're teaching. Verse 4. Five, the goal of our instruction, love, pure heart, good conscience, sincere faith. Notice verse 15. It's a trustworthy statement deserving full, full, notice, full acceptance. Full acceptance. Verse 17. Um, this lofty theology of, of, of God, king, eternal, immortal, invisible, only God, glory and honor forever and ever. Um, look at chapter 2. 
um, there in verse 5. There's one mediator, God and man. This is teaching doctrine. Um, verse 13 and 14. Adam was first created, then Eve. Um, the woman was deceived. Look at chapter 3, verse 1. It's a trustworthy statement, he says. Chapter 3, 15, um, how you should conduct yourselves. Now, this is your behavior in the household of God, which is that pillar and support of the truth. Chapter 4, verse 1. Let me tell you, the latter times, we've already talked about that. Mm -hmm. Expected. This is what Tom was saying. Expected. The doctrines of demons. Again, there is doctrinal um, misappropriation error in the church. Who's behind it? Well, the scripture just says demons are. So, verse 6. Um, the words of the faith and the sound doctrine which you've been following. Verse 9. Trustworthy statement. Verse 11. Prescribe and teach these things. Verse 16, play a close attention to yourself and to your teaching, he says. And then it ends, I think the last one is chapter 6, verse 2. Teach and prescribe and preach these principles. Pretty convincing, at least for me it is. All scripture is inspired by God. We read that in 2 Timothy 3. And yet there is a sense in which those of us who are in leadership uh, find ourselves again and again and again in the pastoral epistles. In fact, I, was, uh, I came across a quote uh, in none other than Augustine, where he says, if you have any position of leadership, the pastoral epistles need sure. to be continually yeah. before your mind. So sure. uh, I appreciate you mentioning First Timothy, Second Timothy, and Titus. Don't let them get out of your thinking ever. Uh, we're going to have three questions, and then no, we're going to try to... What's that? The timing. Yeah, three okay. questions. Time's running out. Number one, Pastor, my wife has just been diagnosed with fill in the blank, incurable disease of some sort, Alzheimer's, ALS, whatever it is. How do I cope with that? How does the truth come to bear on this? Bill? Uh, again, you're going to go to uh, trusting God. Um, some have had that, heard those words. Trust God. Uh, I was in a foreign country and heard those words. Trust God. That's well, what you have to believe. Very quickly. I'll, I'll defer. Huh? <laughs> well, I mean, something like that. There's so many, there's so many different nuances, but ultimately, you first start with their faith. Are they really believers? And I know that seems like such a, uh, it can become such a, um, a difficult thing at times. You've somebody in your church for a long time, and they're going through a hardship. And uh, as you look at that, you might sit there and go, well, let's go back over first the truth before we get into the particulars of your situation. Yes, of course, this is hard. But what does God teach us about our faith? What does God teach us about perseverance? And you might find out oftentimes that I mean, you know that there's goats and sheep in your flock. You know there's no question. And after you establish that, they sometimes will come to the realization of what their faith is, and therefore those, those obstacles become not so um, incredibly difficult anymore because they realize it's the burden of suffering like Christ. And if they, they are believers, then you can get into the, the specific application of Yes, like you said, trusting the Lord with all your heart, leaning not on your own understanding. I, I taught through the book of Job uh, for 60 messages. And um, at the end of the book, as you know, Job through the whole time is complaining and, and lifting his fist and, and is being barraged by all these different uh, teachers giving him the implication that he was the one that sinned and therefore this is why this has happened. And at the end, God comes in in the famous... Um, monologue, longest portion of God speaking in the Bible, and he never gives him an answer. He never tells him why. He never tells him why his family was destroyed. He never tells him why his health was devastated. He never tells him why everything was taken from him. He just says, I am God, and where were you when I did all of this? And, and that's a lesson. That's a lesson that I've actually taught to people <clears throat> in the hospital when they little girl was sick and has a form of cancer and the in-laws have come into town and we're speaking about that and I say because God says the answer to the issue is I am God 
and then we'd have to go down the elevator with them, walk them to their parking space, and there's silence because they don't even want to talk to me because they think I've been so insensitive and so harsh because I didn't give them an answer other than what the scripture says, which is we submit to God. This is God's will, and we know he's righteous and good, and there is no answer other than trust him. So it puts us in a situation where making sure first they're saved uh, to the degree that we can, and then administering the truth, and then actually being prepared for being misunderstood, and just prayerful, and hoping that the Lord softens their heart. Can I, let me we, yes, say go ahead. something to this. I think this is important, too. Um, truth triumph. We're hearing a lot of excellent preaching about these things. Uh, we are men who believe truth. Um, but as a pastor, learn that you don't always have to give an answer. True. Um, here's something else you can do. Someone comes to me, and I've had it before, when I was particularly pastoring for those 20 years, uh, I don't have to have a solution. Silence can be ministry for someone. Hold their hand. I'm there with you. Don't think that somehow you have to walk them through what I just walked through in First Timothy. Then you're, you're an expositor now because you've given them all these wonderful biblical answers. Uh, be quiet for a while. Cry with somebody for a while mm -hmm. is what you need to do. That's the best thing that Job's friends did. Yeah. The only good thing they did. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. We... So be careful, guys, in thinking that so, okay, I, I'm a believer in truth. Uh, okay, I've got to, Romans, what, Romans 8, 28, I've got to get Job, I've got to do this, I have to say that, I have to say that. No, just, what, what are you feeling? We have an Are Alzheimer's you? support ministry here at Grace Church. Mm -hmm. We've had people who have uh, gone through that route. We've had families that deal with it. We've been meeting for about uh, something like 11 years. We've seen something like 20 people. Uh, we took stock this week to try to think through. When you get this kind of word, you will become a theologian one way or another. You will either be a theologian that is solidly biblical and right and good, or you'll be a bad theologian. You'll be blaming God one way or another. So focusing on truth is sometimes extremely important. We've looked at the reality of aging. This last time we met, we looked at the importance of being created in the image of God, the Imago Dei. Uh, how is it that we treat the individual, the family who's going through that? We remember that they are in the image of God. We remember the reality of the fall. Truth helps. It's sometimes it's the only help that you're going to have when you're going through that crisis. Next question. Pastor, and this is actually a pastor who's giving the question. I have given everything I have had I could to the sermon I just preached. Time away from my family. Time away from my kids. I worked hard into the evening. I poured out my heart and I go into the office on Monday morning, and I've got half a dozen emails from people who listen to me, and they're just ripping me apart. Or you could change the uh, scenario and say, I've been counseling this couple for the longest period of time, and now I open up the newspaper, or I turn on the internet, and I see my name being just ripped to shreds. Never thought of that. Never thought of that. Yeah, we need to kind of... How does truth triumph? How does truth help you to cope in that? Tom. <laughs> um, I'm going to do something a little bit different here. Yeah. I, 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 not that I don't know the answer, because I'm just going to do what Carl Giving says. Giving Bill time silence. to think. No, 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 no. no. I, I, no. I, I don't I know just, the answer, Tom, so please. I, would, I, would, I really want to. I'm not trying to forego it. But I think we only have like 20-something yeah, minutes. I want to hear from you guys. I want to hear questions that you have. And if that's your question, I'd love to answer it. But I'd love to know what's on your all's hearts, too. So when you come for a question and answer, I want it to be at least partially towards you as well. Is that okay? So do you have a question? If you could walk up to the mics and ask something for us for the last 20 minutes so that we can... Uh, I want to know what's on your heart. And if, if your heart is about those emails, then I'd just say... Be silent, be kind. The longer the email, the shorter the response. That's what I All say. All right, so we've had an answer. I was going to overrule That's the an brother. Answer. That's the answer. All right. There you go. Committed to Christ. All right. Thank you. I wanted to know how Grace Church handles a divisive person or identifies a divisive person versus somebody that's hard to handle. Mm. 
Hmm. And especially, too, if they want to come back to your church, is there a rematriculation? And, um, and as far as um, the doctrine, when, when they first come to Grace Church, I've, I've heard good that um, they don't have to subscribe to everything in the do doctrinal statement perfectly because you want to give people that are new to the scripture more time. There's churches by me in New York where they have the 1689 confession, and you got to subscribe to it as soon as you come to the church. So s right. speak to those issues for me. Gentlemen? I think for the divisive yeah. person, if I may speak to that, sure. I mean, Titus 310, they would be put out of the church. Some of the I characteristics? They, yeah, that, that, that person who is divisive. You know, divisive. What is a divisive person? Uh, they would be uh, calling up others and saying the pastor did this or the pastor's wife did this or... They're, they're talking about the doctrine then. They could be divisive with the doctrine. Those kinds of things, they should be put out of the church. Matter of fact, we did it in one week once where the fellow said that on a Sunday, next Sunday he was gone. Wow. Because you don't want the church to be divided. That's, that's one thing. How do you get them back? How do you get them back? That's going to take some time. That's right. The elders are going to have to sit down with him and talk with him or her and work through the issues. It's not just one sitting that you spend 15, 20, an hour minute, uh, an hour with them. You need to spend time because you want to make sure the person that's coming back actually knows what they did wrong going. Mm -hmm. And some of them don't understand that sometimes. Mm -hmm. They yeah. can have doctrinal differences. You know, if, if you want to believe in uh, certain things, that's okay. There are certain key uh, doctrines that they must believe. It's like I, I asked, had this couple for counseling once, and, and, I, and I asked for their testimonies. The gal gave me her testimony, and I'm in my mind going, I don't know. And the guy gave me his testimony, and they said, but I don't believe that Jesus is God. I said, you just made that easy for me. <laughs> you're not a Christian. I, I mean, I did that immediately. He said, you're not a Christian. He started arguing. I said, we'll get to that. Okay, we'll get to that. We'll talk about that. But you obviously have a terrible marriage. Let's work on that a little bit. But let's, let's, let, let's get that. You understand you're not a Christian. So I think those are the kinds of things. You guys want to add anything? Well, you, you need to ask the question about rematriculation. Um, that's If they're repentant, sure. But there's what Bill said, observation based on the gra mm -hmm. gravity of what, why they left. Um, and that may take longer. It could be a shorter period of time um, based on how repentant they are. We want to restore. Galatians, we want to restore. Mm -hmm. We want to set the bone in order again, um, but we have to look out for the flock. Factious and divisive conduct, by yep. the way, is recognized as a public sin. Calvin points this out, that will require quicker action mm -hmm. sure. to protect the flock on the part of the elders. Now, a lady once said to me that uh, she didn't believe all that we believe the grace. I said, what do you believe that we don't? She said, believe, uh, speaking in tongues. I said, well... You can become a member still, so you want to become a member, but you just don't go around professing that sure. as doctrine. Three years later, she walks up to me. She says, well, I believe like you do. I said, can you please tell me what I believe? <laughs> I, I want you to tell me and articulate that. And she sure. said, well, I realize I, I speaking in tongues is not something for today. Sure. If we can uh, make the distinction, we believe that if you're part of the body of Christ, you, at least in theory, should be able to be a part of our church, a member sure. of our church. That does not mean that you're going to be asked to teach a Bible study or uh, lead a mm -hmm. fellowship group. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Over, Over here, here, Chris. Uh, I think you. There we go. Hi. Uh, I had a question in. <laughs> okay. okay. In the conference about there like truth triumphs, there's there's definitely big theological differences between like John MacArthur and John Piper. So. And then you have another category of like Romans 14 issues, of conscience issues. So how do you stand for the truth dogmatically, but also like leave the door open for disagreements on other matters and then disagreements on conscience issues? Well, something that it's kind of alluded to by the first man's question as well is, you know, we have a statement here that's been very specifically called what we teach not what we believe, because we have thousands of people here that might believe different things, but this is what we teach from the pulpit. So that's a very important distinction right off the bat. So yes, there's differences between John MacArthur and, uh, and uh, John Piper, and 
we, we used to joke about the fact when R.C. would come here and preach that uh, we'd love to have him come here and preach, but he, he wouldn't join the church uh, because he wouldn't want to join our church because we wouldn't let him teach. So, uh, <laughs> but, 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 and he wouldn't want to because there's no way he'd want to join a church that uh, wasn't a preterist. Anyway, so, but, that, but the point being is, so we can, as, as Bill said, as Carl has alluded to as well, you can come here and believe our soteriology, you can believe different aspects of, of uh, our, the doctrine of sin, et cetera, but when it comes to some things, and it's always eschatology, and it's always the gifts. That's what it boils down to. Sure. Sometimes it has to do lately with some aspects of the atonement, but usually sure. it's those two things. Then, you know, we... we try to say we're all in process of learning, if you have a teachable spirit, I think this might be what you're asking, I'm not sure, then you can, of course, be here, and we want to come alongside if you become divisive or you want that you want to teach a Bible study, like we said, or you want to um, you know, make your stand, then you're not going to be happy here. Why would you be here? You want to go someplace else. People go, well, you're the only Reformed church that is in the neighborhood or in the air, maybe the state. And uh, we're sitting there saying, well, that might be true, but can we just agree while you're here on those things like the deity of Jesus, like um, the doctrine of atonement, and not major on those things that are secondary until they become primary in your mind, and then we have to address them. So, and that takes a lot of um, sensitivity to the nuances of that. That's not a hard and fast thing. That through, that's through hours of counseling and talking to people and trying to be sensitive to that. 1 Corinthians 15 talks about matters of first importance. Mm. And you mentioned Romans 14, and you can see some sure. of the matters outlined there that we would probably not consider to be of first or primary importance. Next yeah. question, okay. over here. Yeah, I would love to know from each one of you, just like y'all have been doing pastoral ministry for so long, and I'm pretty young, I'm 24, and I'm just curious why each one of you has done pastoral ministry and why you have chosen to stay in it for so long. Oh, well, that's fairly simple in one sense. Uh, it's a calling. Uh, it's a calling. Uh, my life was on a very different pathway when I was in college. Uh, and the Lord saved me and totally changed my career thought, things that I was gearing to do since I was about so tall, and I could not ignore it. Mm -hmm. And so it sought me out. And then what happened in life is that there was a transference of what I was desiring into now what I desired. And that desire now overwhelms me, mm -hmm. and it keeps me. And as Paul would say, you know, like the love of Christ controls him. Mm -hmm. So now, because it's been shed abroad in our hearts and shed abroad in my heart, now I am, like Paul would say to Timothy, no soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him. Mm -hmm. So now that I've been enlisted as a new soldier, because that's what I wanted to do, make a career of the military, and I was headed down that path, the Lord says, no, you will, be, you will fight another type of battle. So why do I remain? Because I'm still enlisted. Um, and the problem with the soldier, there's something that's called AWOL. Uh, I don't, you cannot go AWOL, which means you, you're away without leave. And the only leave that I'll get is heaven. So that's it. I'll do this as long as I can. It may not be in the same capacity, but I'll still do it. Have any former Marines in here? Marine Corps motto? Simplify. Simplify. What's it mean? Always faithful. Always faithful. That's right. Yes. Okay. Uh, for myself, in 1982, I got saved to Montreal, Canada, Canada on a business trip. And uh, I had no idea what that meant, getting saved. I mean, huh. I had no idea what it meant reading a Bible. I had never seen one before. All of those kinds of things. And... Instead of divorcing my wife when I was coming back home to California, <clears throat> which I was going to do, so mm. I got to find out how to be a husband, mm. got to find out how to be um, a, a father. I got to learn how to do all these things. So sure. I got somebody to start speaking into my life right here at Grace Community Church. <clears throat> By the way, the lady in Canada has pointed me to this church. Mm. So wow. that's what I did. And, and when I was meeting with this man, he poured his life into me. 
he, he taught me these things. And so when these master seminaries started, uh, I said to my wife, I think I've been called. <laughs> she says, I don't know how to play the piano. <laughs> <laughs> I said, don't worry about the piano. She said, but I don't have a flower we'll dress. We'll get you lessons. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, I don't have a flower dress. I said, I can take care of that. But, but that's what, and why do I stay? I, I stay because I see God's people being helped. I see people getting saved, stopped from getting a divorce, stopped from doing sin. I, I love to see that, and my wife and I rejoice with that uh, regularly in our home on a Sunday afternoon when we have people over. Tom? Well, first of all, what a great question from a 24-year-old. Yeah, year old. that's right. And I pray that that's on your heart. I, I'm sure that's why you're asking yeah. the question. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to be a pastor when I was five years old. Uh, and the only problem was I wasn't saved till I was 30. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I think for me, it's been trying to catch up for lost time. And, sure. um, but honestly, if you have a heart for people, you're going to be, just to be full disclosure, you're going to be hurt. You're going to be wounded. Yes, There's sure. a lot of disappointment. In fact, I'd say the closer sometimes you feel that you're getting to a breakthrough with someone, uh, the quicker you can find out that they will malign you, turn from you, and then um, sure. it, it's very painful at times. But there are those moments where... Uh, God supports you in your own soul and in prayer and also from others coming alongside from time to time. In fact, just real quick, I was just getting my coffee. <laughs> this is such a funny thing. And this young man comes up to me. And he says, um, Pastor Tom. And I said, yes. He goes, he goes, well, you certainly, he goes, time has certainly been hard on you the last 10 years. <laughs> I said, you know, <laughs> Thank bless you, you brother. Uh, uh, be, be warm and be filled and get out of my way. No, I didn't say that. And, uh, and, and, and it kind of threw me because I've never had that compliment. And uh, he said, he said, I was in your uh, preaching lab 10 years ago, and when I came up to preach, you told me to sit down and come back only when I was prepared. Mm. And I'm thinking, that's why he said that. And, <laughs> and then he said, thank you so much for telling me that because sure. I wasn't ready. So sometimes it takes a while for that to come. Sure. And that encouraged 10 years for me. Uh, yeah. Of course, by God's grace, I didn't remember who he was because yeah. I blocked those things out. <laughs> but so, and Tom, but, you still don't. Yeah. <laughs> but, but what an encouragement. And I yeah, pray for, for your, good for your question. I was yeah. in college. And I distinctly remember the evening, somehow or other, one evening, the passage, John 21, feed my sheep, mm. you know, the, the mm. three times repeated yeah. phrase, just began to drum itself into my mind, and I have never fully been able to get that out mm. of my mind. Mm. And that, uh, I think God used to start pointing me in the direction. I'd, I'd been a preacher's kid, and yet at that point in time, it started moving me in the direction it takes a while to be able to see how it all gets implemented. But that passion is there, that realization, Acts 20, the Holy Spirit, despite the fact that some men connive themselves into the position, the Holy Spirit makes men elders. And when we are put in that position, we stay at our post. Yeah. Semper Fi. W one last um, thought real quick, though, before he leaves. Yeah. Uh, Spurgeon's lecture to my students. I just thought it today. Okay, on calling. Okay. He has a great section on calling. Okay. And I'll tell you what else, since about calling, something that impacted me when I first came <laughs> to the seminary, uh, Albert Martin, yes. the call to the ministry. Yes. Wow. Mm. Li every man should listen to that. Mm. The call to the ministry, Albert Martin. And mm -hmm. if you start listening to Al Martin, you wonder whether you should go into the ministry. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah. You're right. We got a brother over here. Brothers, uh, thank you uh, for your wisdom. I have a question. So... You know, when you get saved, right, you start reading the Bible, and you're like, this is amazing, right? You start learning and growing, and then, and then you start discovering all these different truths and theologies and just deepening that, right? And then, you know, 10 years will pass. You've read your Bible every year. You've read, ten, you read your Bible 10 years, 10 times, 20 times, maybe 30 times. And sometimes you, you kind of get the curse of knowledge where you, you know what the next page is going to say. You know what the next chapter contains. You've preached through it, right? How do you prevent it from just being, I'm reading this to preach, to serve, but I'm reading it for my soul, for my spirit. How do you, 
how you great rekindle question. that. Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I teach a course at the seminary. It's an elective. It's called Pastoral Holiness. And we address the issue of how does one maintain a spiritual life in the ministry. And one thing is that you have to take care of your own soul. Uh, there has to be a delight. You have to cherish the Lord. Uh, you have to believe um, what uh, the psalmist did in Psalm 37 and 4, delight yourself in the Lord. You have to believe what the psalmist said in Psalm 27, that he wants to behold the beauty of, of God and to gaze at his beauty in the temple. There has to be that sense of I need my soul to be nourished for my people. So one reason you do it is not simply for an academic exercise and even to prepare a sermon. You do it because first you are a child of God. Before I had a call to the ministry, I was simply a child of God. And so I have to nurture my life just as a child. And what happens with preachers, they can learn too much uh, and they forget what is absolutely important, which is first, I'm his child. Let me behave like a child. Let me sit at the feet of my father. Let me cherish Jesus Christ and his death. Um, let me be um, appalled if I preach on hell and I don't have, like Whitfield said, tears in my eyes. Um, let me be like an Owen who said when he felt a sense of worldliness that he would read like just 40 chapters of the Bible because he felt worldly. Um, and this is Owen as well with his communion with God. So we do this out of communion uh, with the living God because of a relationship. And so it's not just another page. It's not just another sermon. Uh, this uh, is a relationship that you're nurturing with the living God. And we have to keep that in front of us. Tom? I just think exactly what he said. Um, and, but to add to that, when you're saying I'm just preparing sermons and I get dry, you know, the big thing that I deal with, because I sometimes on a Saturday, I'll listen to six or seven sermons that I have to critique. My whole Saturday, hmm. and it's called Sanctification Saturday, yeah. and, uh, <laughs> and we're just sermon after sermon, and what my, my number one critique many times is not their exegesis, is not the fact that they didn't get sure. their point, but the fact that they speak it as if it's some kind yeah. of flat, unaffected, and so my question always goes back to them. I go, how much time did you spend really grappling with your own heart in this mm -hmm. text? So you, you sure. might be giving sermons every week, but, uh, and they may be biblical, but you're not really allowing yourself. I think John MacArthur says he has two positions when he studies, either this position or this position. He's either yeah. here or here. And I said so many people don't spend enough time with here. their back That's right. contemplating their own life in the text. I don't know about you guys, and I'm not trying to make anything about me, but I cry every time I prepare for a sermon. Because I'm a rotten sinner that needs God's grace every moment of my life. And I'm re so if you can go through a sermon and be dry, what's the old saying that Moody said? You know, this book will keep you from sin, and sin will keep you from this book. Mm -hmm. And so just remember that and, and, and allow God to break your heart down, because otherwise you might be effective in word, but, but not in heart. And I think, yeah. I think your people can tell that too, but God obviously knows. Sure. You know what? Uh, gentleman once said to me that uh, I study the Word of God because I get paid to do that. Huh. And he did. Hmm. And I said, well, it's priceless. <laughs> so you study the Word of God because it's priceless. I'm going to learn more. I'm going to sure. grow to be the man of God that he wants me to be. And I know I'm not the man of God that he wants me to be yet. And so I, I study for that reason. Now, when you hit Leviticus, you go, why am I reading this? <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a reason for reading it. You see God's exactness. You see God's uh, um, masterfulness in putting things together. That's what you have to see is another aspect of God. It's not always the same. And so see it for those kinds of things that it can just give you a different picture of who he is. Yeah. One of the things that I love most about our pastor, he has been pastoring for 55 years. He was a preacher's kid. He grew up. He still is excited about finding new things. And that is manifest sure. for those of us who have the chance to be close to him and to talk to him. As a practical matter, you're going to laugh when I say this. Allow yourself the luxury of periodically buying a new Bible. 
Sometimes it's enjoyable just to be able to look at that, get lost, think about the texture, but then focus on the words. Regardless, though, I'm going to take you back to what Paul tells Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, and it's actually in the imperative mode, verse 14, as for you, you must continue. You must continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. We do not have the option of not continuing in the study of the Word. Sure. Pray that God will enlighten your minds. Pray that God will show you. We have the expression at times in our culture, stay hungry. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Mm -hmm. It's an ongoing present reality. Stay hungry. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other questions? We have one, one more, more here. That's okay. All right. Um, um, aside from the scriptures, for you as pastors, what would be the one book that you would commend to all of the oh, pastors? Oh, great question. Bill? Depends upon what week you're talking about. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I read lots, and, and lots of books, um, one of them, The Power of um, Christian Contentment, just recently, uh, has touched my heart. Uh, I've uh, fallen in love with that, but I also like to read uh, biographies. Yes. Um, and so I'm, I'm reading those kinds of things. I, I've got um, one now about a guy called R.C. Sproul. We mm -hmm. were talking about him before, and I'm reading that, uh, that uh, Nichols put together. And so I'm always reading, I've always got something and uh, then the war with children just came out, a uh, war against children just came out, and I'm reading that as well. So I, I just like to read. Is um, there one particular book that you have read in your life that stands out uh, as perhaps the most important thing you've read outside of the Bible? Outside of the Bible, I, I, whatever I'm reading. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's just, I got to leave it there because I... I have so many that I've been through. Um, if you want to talk about missions, I've got books. If you want to talk about history, I've got books. And that's, that's, so I'll leave it there. Okay. Tom. Um, boy. Let's get to Tom and then <laughs> Are we'll you get Tom? to you. I, I don't know. Yeah, oh, boy, he's thinking about me. Uh, no, without a doubt, it's uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones' book, uh, Sermons on the Mount. Mm. Uh, it is. I've, I've gone through that so many times. I disciple men through that book. If you want to have your heart, um, reacquainted with the most famous sermon our Lord ever gave, uh, go to Martin Lloyd-Jones. Uh, it is priceless. It is so rich. Uh, so I, I can't commend that enough. That's the book I always go back. Because even just going through the Beatitudes, your heart will get refreshed and convicted, and you'll start to just meditate, and it's wonderful. Fantastic. Wow, that's, that's hard. Um, Whitfield by Dalimore. Mm. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Biography. Yeah, biography. Yeah, theological, going all the way back to my young days in the faith, knowing God. Yeah, Packer. Um, great impact on me. For me, the book, the one book that has had probably the most overriding influence over the I years. What are you going to guess I'm saying? Calvin's Institutes. You got it. <laughs> Absolutely. I know this man. Yeah. And <laughs> read, read both the first one. And the last one. And the first one, he's fire all the way. A sense of humor that you couldn't use today. Uh, in his last edition, reasoning, precise, deep, intense. Yeah, yeah. Um, Martin Lloyd-Jones did a course of reading that I had stumbled into myself without realizing that the doctor had recommended it. You read recommend a book of doctrine, maybe a selection of sermons, a commentary on a particular book, alternate that with a book of biography, a great man in the, war, in the history of the church, Dallimore's uh, biography yeah, of Whitfield. It's just unbelievable. Two volume set. Yeah. You'll, you, if you look close enough, you'll find a great abuse of uh, church discipline. Yeah. Dallimore writes about how Wesley disciplined a woman out because she did not respond to his romantic overtures. Um, sense of humor. But you'll see how truth That's gets the way to get her. ironed out. Don't try it, guys. Don't try it. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, let's not have you come back next year. <laughs> but um, how truth gets ironed out over the course of time. Sure. Read the biography of Athanasius, um, some of the history of the church, and then go back to another book on church doctrine. Uh, studies in the Sermon on the Mount is fantastic. Uh, but go back and forth. Make sure you know the Puritans. Okay? Yep. Amen. Let's see. Tell me a choice of recommend, top recommended Puritan. Let's give me a choice of names. Sibs. Sibs. Yeah, Richard Sibs. Yeah. Watson. What's that? Watson. Watson. Okay. Owen. 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 Owen, you want to read the abridgments. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, again, Lord, I thank you for each of these men. Thank you for the fun that we've had this afternoon. Thank you for their passion for Christ. Father, I pray that your hand of blessing, chastening, and direction would rest upon each of them. Father, may we be found faithful. May there be none of us who would in any way bring disgrace or disrepute to the gospel of Christ. We love you and we thank you, Lord, for the privilege. We look forward to the day when we hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Father, thank you for this privilege. Guide us in all we do through the rest of the day. Amen.